I'm very happy that my director, uh, Dr. Patrick Carabury, uh, can join us today. And so he's a big supporter of this event, and we talked about that uh, about a year ago, so we should be speaking to him. And so if all things goes well, he's going to kind of like give a lecture uh, uh, next semester uh, in, in the spring. And um, I'm also on the board, and so I see my, uh, some of my board members here and uh, the Chinese garden. So we, we, we really think about how to make good use of this space. It's a very beautiful space. And not just for Chinese music, because there's many, many, many programs about Chinese music. But as we know, like China has become a kind of a like very, very strong global presence. And we know from history, I'm a historian, I'm a musicologist. And so we know that since the, the 1880s, you know, even all the way through uh, the Chinese uh, Immigration Act, so, uh, so like, Chinese students are always kind of like welcome, different kind of inter-Asia dialogue. So, uh, so, so they were like, the, the new Asia framework, the inter-Asia framework is so always a part of Chinese town. So we are beginning to piece together a history for uh, BC history and also for global history. Some of our students are doing this at BC. And so, and then also, you know, like this event, and uh, we, we're talking about a series of uh, 12 lectures and I could read all of them. And so like the start of this um, semester all the way through 2024. And then we're going to bring together experts and, and graduate students at UBC who work on different kinds of world music to present for this community, you know, uh, the latest knowledge. So therefore the idea is that, um, so we have a kind of a stronger communication between UBC and, and the Chinese garden. And so with the support of, of, of my board member, you know, I, I, I feel pretty supported to, to launch this lecture series. And so this lecture series is funded very generously by Heritage BC and the 150 Memorial Grant uh, last year. And so like today, you know, it's my absolute pleasure to present um, my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Tenser, uh, uh, Professor of Music of Ethnomusicology at the University of Columbia. And he, he, his writing include Gamelon, Gong, yeah. yeah, and the art of 20th century Balinese music is world expert in Balinese music and published in the year 2000. And he edited two volumes of analytics, analytic, analytical studies in world music and published in 2006 and 2011 with uh, Professor John Brogan. So um, music theory and musical, uh, ethnomusicology were really know that this collaboration between music theory and ethnomusicology is really garnering a lot of attention in scholarly world. So therefore, I want the community to know that, oh, like, UBC is doing very, very exciting. We're all kind of like merging these two things together. And I, as I, I, I'm a musicologist, um, so I kind of like learn from them how to do these things. So therefore, it's just a lot of learning experience for all of us. And so um, he's been studying Balinese music since uh, 1977, so it's been 46 years. And so like, we, we have a world-class um, expert you know, with decades of experience sharing with us uh, um, with this community's expertise. And he co-founded the Gamelon and Sekar Jaya in, in Berkeley, California in 1979. And that group is still getting a lot of funding. And so thanks to, uh, thanks to Michael. And um, his numerous compositions is also a composer. And uh, for Gamelon, uh, uh, since 1982, and, and some of his compositions have been cited in the Balinese press as significant contribution to um, the Balinese cultural heritage. And, um, and some of the compositions are available on New World Records, and so it's my absolute pleasure to introduce, um, to present uh, Professor Michael Tenser and his friends. <laughs> Thanks for coming out, everybody. It's nice to be here. Um, I'm a professor, but I'm planning to do this in the most casual possible way. And uh, just want to give you a general introduction to this topic. And I have three wonderful dancers who are here to perform for you in a little while, and two great musicians, in particular our uh, resident Balinese artist at UBC, who's going to be here for the next few years, and I'll tell you about them later. So I'm going to blah blah for a little while and play some music for you and then we're going to do a small performance and then you'll have a chance to ask questions of uh, performers too. So, um, so Bali is very famous in the world and how many of you uh, have been there? Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay. And how many of you 
have no idea what it, where it is. Don't be shy. Okay, well everybody knows this. And if you've been there, I'm sure you have seen Bali's music and dance because it's a very important part of their culture. And um, I'm going to give you my some of my perspective on it, which goes back a long way. And I'll just get started. One of the reasons that uh, I'm, uh, you know, that Hedy invited me to be here today is because I've been very active in promoting this music uh, wherever I've lived throughout my entire adult life. And we have a gamelan group in Vancouver, uh, which rehearses out at UBC. And uh, here's, a perform here's a picture of one of our best performances a couple of years ago, just prior to COVID. And these are the instruments of a Balinese gamelan. And here are a bunch of Canadians, mostly Canadians, playing them. And some of the instruments are up here behind me right now. And so what I'll start do to start off is, um, though there's a drawing of the, of the instruments, thinks, um, makes it a little bit clearer what the actual collection is. And so you have uh, keyed instruments around the back, uh, and you have gongs that are laid out horizontally as they are in the front row and along here, and you have these big hanging gongs. And it's a very, uh, and a couple of drums and a flute, and it makes a very uh, intense, uh, vibrating, pulsating bronze sound. And so what, I think what I should do first is just play a little bit and also put it together with the dance because, oops, come back. Um, because Balinese music is inseparable from dance and inseparable from many parts of Balinese culture. And uh, there's no better way for me to bring you into it than to take you to the scene of a recent festival, a temple festival, that took place in the Balinese village of Pinda earlier this year. And this is a totally typical event. Uh, every Balinese village has at least three main temples, and those temples uh, go on a ritual cycle, and every year by the Balinese calendar, they have a birthday celebration, and for that, they almost always have some kind of performances, and the public, the, the local public comes, they worship at the temple, but then they go outside at night, and there is music and dance. And it, <clears throat> this was a particularly special occasion because um, the people who ran this temple, um, all friends of ours, uh, decided to uh, bring out some of the uh, senior musicians who were all stars in their day and get them to perform again together. And um, it's pretty spectacular. And this, this dance, Taruna Jaya, is a very virtuoso thing for both the musicians and the dancers. So I'm going to take you to the temple, let you see a little bit of what the scene is like, and play a little bit of the music and the dance, and talk about that. And then we'll go from there. So, um,
music doesn't come knocking on your door and say, I'm a pretty tune, or this isn't you know, very sweet, or relaxing music. It's actually really intense and really complicated and dense. Because uh, all the music's being made by people pounding these bronze instruments, and they're playing very, very complicated patterns. So uh, the least I can do to help you out is isolate some of those things for you, just for a second, to get into the musical side of it, which is what drew me into it so much for all these years, because the music is so interesting, the way it's constructed, and the principles behind it, and as a composer, this was a total bonanza for me for most of my life. It's just to think, to, to, to absorb and stimulate my imagination with the kinds of things that they were doing. Um, and I'll just focus on one idea that's very important to this music, and actually not just to this music, but to many kinds of music around the world, and that's the idea of interlocking. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later in terms of its origins, but there are lots of musical practices in the world in which people really value kind of really close rhythmic coordination where you have at least two different musical parts that fit together like this. Like, I play my part and you play your part and your part fits into the spaces of my part. And uh, the thing that, they, that makes Balinese uh, interlocking different is well, it's extremely, become extremely elaborate and also it's as fast as you can possibly do it. It's so fast that uh, you know, it seems kind of breathless to the point where, you know, when you were just listening to it now, you probably couldn't tease the different things apart. But here are two videos of some of the melodic interlocking and of the drumming interlocking. And just, um, where did my cursor go? <clears throat> Here's one of some of the melodic interlocking, and you'll see two people playing on opposite sides of the same instrument. And uh, when one plays, the other fills in, when one rests, the other fills in the space in between. It'll be really apparent to And very quickly. And it's from this particular piece we just heard.
same thing there, the hands moving very rapidly in alternation. But a lot of what's happening in that, in that video too is something that, uh, much more than music, it's the vibe. It's the feeling of learning that music in the environment where most people learn it. Like there is a music school, but when you become a musician in Bali, you don't go for private lessons at your teacher's house or anything like that. You don't have to practice at home. All music learning is social. And it's just hanging out with your teachers, maybe with your parents or your older brothers and sisters, and absorbing the music gradually over a lifetime because it's heard constantly in your village at different rituals and it's just kind of uh, by osmosis. So I love that scene because it also reminds me of my own life when I was living there in my 20s and just doing that every day and learning music that way for, for many, many years. And um, you know, I'll about that. So, okay, so that's just a taste of the, of the uh, interlocking rhythms in the music and the feeling of being at a Balinese performance. I'll go back now and cover a couple of basic things for those of you that don't know. There's a map of Indonesia on the top right, and there's a map of Bali, and uh, they speak mostly the Balinese language there, which also the Indonesian, because Bali is part of the Indonesian archipelago, part of the Indonesian Republic. Uh, Bali is 5,780 square kilometers, and so that's about one, let's see, maybe 10, maybe one 200th the size of British Columbia, um, or a little bit more than that, I suppose. It's one, um, and the population, but the population is roughly the same. Bali has 4.3 million people, British Columbia has 5.1. It's one of 37 Indonesian provinces. And in Bali, there are nine regencies, uh, where, uh, which you can see divided up here on this map. Sorry if I'm blocking your view. Oh, sorry, I guess just stand over here. There are nine regencies, and in those regencies, I don't know how accurate this number is, but something like 719 villages. And uh, in the villages, the villages are broken down into sub-districts that are called Banjar. And a Banjar is the name of a village, reached a village uh, you know, subdivision, but also it's the name of a place. There's a Banjar building, it's kind of like a community center, which is something we're familiar with in Vancouver. And in the community center are stored the gamelan instruments that are used for, uh, for rituals or, uh, or for just for fun or whatever it is that the village people have decided to do over the years. And so, if you do all the multiplication, small villages might only have one or two banjars, big villages might have six or seven banjars, but we're talking about many thousands of gamelan in the island there, which is quite a lot more than the number of symphony orchestras in British Columbia. In other words, I'm trying to tell you that music is really dense in their social fabric, and it's constantly being heard and practiced. Uh, and it, ask any Balinese musician, and they will tell you that the music is basically a religious music because it is inseparable from the rituals that they do as part of their Hindu. But it's not exactly Hindu. It has orig important origins in Hin Hinduism from India. About between 2,000 and 1,500 years ago, there was a migration of, um, of Hindu scribes, priests, warriors, all sorts of people who basically colonized most of Southeast Asia during that long period long ago, and their religion reached, reached Bali. So even today, you can hear uh, liturgies performed in Sanskrit, just like they absorbed them from India a long time ago. And there are many, many elements of Hinduism, but of course, it didn't come into a blank slate. There were already all sorts of local practices, what we would call animistic. Uh, that's what the anthropologists would call it, I guess. <clears throat> practices and so by now, you know, 1500 years later, the music scribes, priests, warriors, all sorts of people who, who, who basically colonized most of Southeast Asia during that long period long ago and their religion reached, reached Bali. So even today, you can hear uh, liturgies performed in Sanskrit, just like they absorbed them from India a long time ago. And there are many, many elements of Hinduism, but of course, it didn't come into a blank slate. There were already all sorts of local practices, what we call animistic, uh, that's what the anthropologists would call, I guess, <coughs> practices. And so by now, you know, 1,500 years later, the, music, the religion is a very complex blending of all these different cultural factors. Plus, later there was Buddhism that came, and Islam came down into the Indonesian archipelago in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. But for some reason, the Balinese didn't buy it, they didn't take it. So it, the Bali is an island of uh, their own religion within Indonesia, which is actually, uh, few people know this, um, 
is actually the most popular, most, has the most, in, the largest Islamic population in any country in the world. And I think the uh, population of Indonesia is, no, percent Islam. I think it's 80 something. Uh, and the, the population of the country as a whole is 280 million, which makes it the fourth largest, fourth most populous country in the world after the US, China, and India. Um, in that order. Uh, but, um, and, some, and a few times in BBC, I taught a class on Indonesian music, and it's remarkable. Uh, you know, everybody knows a lot about Chinese culture, especially in Vancouver, and Indonesian culture not so much because there hasn't been over the centuries that much migration from Indonesia. There's a couple of thousand Indonesians, as far as I know, that live in the Vancouver area, but we don't think of Indonesia as a big cultural force. And um, I'm not sure I know why. Uh, Indonesians just seem to be happy in their islands and don't, don't move about too much. Anyway, uh, so all of those Gamalan, all of that religious activity, uh, and all of those temples, if you multiply the number of villages, times at least three temples, but usually many, many more than that, and plus lots of, a whole other network of temples that are alive in different regions, and there's a million possibilities. Some huge, some small, every home has its own small shrine temple within it, to which people have to make uh, offerings of flour and incense and food to every, every once in a while, and they have a very complicated calendrical system, different than ours, which uh, regulates you know, what offerings they're supposed to do, when, and which temple has a birthday ceremony and when. And um, so it's a, it's a pretty, you know, most of my Balinese friends tell me that um, it's, a, it's, it's a hassle to be Balinese because you constantly are obligated to some ritual or other. And um, <clears throat> when someone like Rian comes to Canada, uh, he doesn't know what to do with himself sometimes because he doesn't have any rituals to and uh, so, so he gets to relax and read a book once in a while, which is nice. Um, but it's it's a it's a very very uh, structured way of life, which still goes on for most people. For most people. Um, anyway, okay. So here's some photos. I mean, this is the famous Bali that those of you who've been there, you've probably seen some images like this. You have Bali's temple. You have Bali's women carrying offerings on their heads. On the upper right there, you have a cremation tower that's being burned. They cremate all of the dead. On the bottom left is a priest praying in the temple. On the bottom right is a cockfight, sometimes illegal, sometimes not. And this is the very rich uh, heritage of cultural tradition that became, in the 20th century, uh, the engine for, oops, they don't see that. The engine for a huge tourist industry. And so those images that I just showed you have been even dressed up and sanitized a bit more uh, with very fancy hotels and swimming pools and uh, promotional literature that presents this image of Bali as this wonderful paradise. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying it is, I'm not saying it isn't, but it's definitely a real place where you have garbage and um, you know, multiple traffic because it's small so they can't fit all the cars on the roads and you have terrorist bombings in 2002 and 2005. So beyond the image of Bali that is sold to tourists, there's a very real world, rich, complicated world that's just as much a part of the contemporary life than anywhere else, as anywhere else. So um, what I'm gonna do, I know I'm gonna run out of time really fast. So the kind of gamelan that we listened to a few minutes ago is one of many, many types. Uh, probably by now, 25, 30, 40 different kinds of gamelan. What do I mean that different kinds of gamelan? Their own particular collection of instruments, some made of bamboo, some made of bronze, some made of iron, uh, some made of mixed materials. If it's, if it's its own kind of gamelan, it will have a particular repertory that's for particular kinds of rituals, or it could just be a gamelan that's for fun. Uh, that's more of a 20th century thing, but anyway, they're very particular, and different regions will specialize in different kinds. So I just thought I'd share with you uh, one other kind, which is a very ancient kind, probably goes back at least a thousand years. And um, one of my doctoral students at UBC wrote a dissertation on it recently, and it's called Gamon Gamon. And it is, uh, oops. Where's my, there we go. Okay, 
It is made of four wooden instruments and two metal ones. And the music that it plays is, direct, is derived directly from, it's still a little bit under research how exactly it happened, but it comes out of the traditions of poetic literature that have been an important part of life in that part of the world for many centuries. And um, the reading and voicing and vocalizing of poetry was important in many, many parts of the world, bards, singers of tales, and things like that. No exception in Bali. And in many ways, these uh, compositions are based directly on the poetry by using some of the different vowel sounds from the poetry to generate the different melodies. I'm not going to give you all the details. I just thought you might be interested to see one of these ancient kinds of music. And my student's a really clever videographer. He sets up five or six different cameras, and you get a separate camera on each instrument so you can see what they're doing. So here's a sample of the Gamalan Gamalan. You just sent this to me this morning. <laughs> Have a listen. Same thing in Bali, they have different rhythms, but same idea. So 
that's some insight for uh, ethnomusicologists like me, maybe folks like you too. It's like, where did music, where did musical rhythms come from? They probably came from the practices of. That, well, they came from many places. I'm not trying to say they came from one place, but that one component of it is people working together in uh, sustaining themselves. So, um, and what else have I got here? I'm going to stop soon so we can do the music. Um, there. Oh, here. Uh, so the, the gamelan I showed you a few minutes ago, the, the gambang, that's a very old one. Uh, and at that time, you know, that we have evidence that that gamelan goes back at least a thousand years. But back then, they didn't really have the technology of casting bronze gongs and keys, which is something came along in probably around the 15th or 14th century. And um, so most Balinese music prior to that time didn't have any gongs or drums. And, but then uh, there was a sort of a middle ages of Balinese music and Balinese society too, with these rather large uh, princely kingdoms that you know ruled parts of the island, or in some cases the whole island, different times. But on one for about 500 years, from about 1400 to 1900, it was basically a, a, monar a monarchic state, but many different ones. Uh, changed a lot of the time. Anyway, if you were a really wealthy Balinese prince, you had this enormous gamelan in your palace called the Gong du Day. Gong is gong. We actually get that word from, from uh, Indonesian languages. And du Day means big. And um, that photo, I took that photo in 1979 when I was hanging out in Bali as a 22-year-old guy snipping with this music. And um, uh, I went up to this village and I heard that they had a rare one of the few remaining big ensembles of this kind. And I basically walked into the village and sat down for a cup of coffee at a roadside stand and uh, mentioned that I was interested in this music. And half an hour later, 50 people in this clothing came out to play the music for me. And in those days, capitalism hadn't come to Bali yet. People weren't working. They were working in, on the, in the rice fields from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Then they went home, had lunch, took a nap, played music. It's a different kind of life. And so, yeah, they just put on a performance for me, and um, I wish I had, I had, probably did record it, but all I had was a really crappy, small cassette recorder. And, um, I was never very good at doing that. Anyway, um, here is a recording of a different and similar ensemble, and it's just a lot of bronze. The keys on those instruments might weigh five kilometers, about kilograms each.
the, the Gamelan group that um, I started in California back when I was in graduate school, which is still going on, Hetty mentioned it earlier, uh, welcomed its first female music director from college. So that was a really a milestone. I don't know. Really great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the how many years of training did you involved in? Yeah, I was thinking that we would show some of the dance movements too. So we are learning from when we are a kid, like five years old. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So since there are no notes, uh, are you able to replicate the same music by just listening? Yeah, you memorize it. The, the way the, the, the learning process for this music is so wonderful. Basically, it's all group, and the teacher comes to your instrument and plays it for you until you understand it, and then you just practice it over and over again. What if there is no someone uh, is able to teach you? Let's say you watch a YouTube clip. Oh, like well, music. Are you able to replicate it? I mean, people do learn that way. Yeah, we have a we have a guy we know did an unbelievable job. He was, he told me in an email, he said, if I'm, I'm not really good at much, but I am good at listening to the same musical fragment 10,000 times. <laughs> so, yeah, but traditionally, you just learn face to face, no by them. And I want to add that UBC student, I've learned this way, uh, so we have to be happy, right? Uh, yeah. 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 But just, is there, is there uh, a change in it? happened over the, the decades. I mean, particularly just because of the internationalism that goes on. And, well, the tourism industry, for example, brings other people up and other ideas, other things. And I just wondered whether you're trying to just in a sort of a gradual movement and yeah. change. Yeah, other than you want to answer that? In, in yes. terms of the role of change, yes. exactly. Yeah. How has Bonnie's music changed in, in the recent past? Yeah. How has it changed in the past 50 years? 40 years. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a lot of influence from many, many kinds of music around the world. So, like, for example, right now, uh, some people like doing, uh, like, composing Balinese music using, like, Western uh, 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 ideology or, or Western ideas. Putting something to the something new. I was just more curious in terms of the ballet itself, whether yeah. there's been a sort of an evolution in moving forward in the music that's been understood after for the last 50 years, that kind of thing. Yeah. And yes, there are copies around the world, obviously. No, obviously, no, that's exactly what he's saying. That in, in, in Bali, it's, it's ridiculous. You can't keep up with how fast it's changing. It's great, too. People like Rihanna and, and other, there's a community of composers that are just uh, full of new ideas. Yeah. Um, any, for anybody, not just, you know, I know I'm the one with gray hair and stuff, but. <laughs> <laughs> Is Rihanna particular to Bali or other parts of Indonesia? Yes. I mean, like, uh, they have it in Java and Lombok too. Okay. Yeah, but different kind of color. Yeah. For the, uh, the instruments, are they still mainly handmade by the small communities or they are the companies making them these days? So to, to, be, to, to cast and forge bronze is a hereditary profession. Mm -hmm. And there are only a small group of people who do it. Lots of people build the cases and carve the cases, but to cast the bronze is only, how many, how many can you Just can, can make gongs and, and put on. Okay. Well, how many karajana? How many karajana? 15? 15. 15 places. That's a lot. Really? That many? So has the number of people uh, playing this instrument been increasing or, or has it been declining? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. More and more, yeah. Because, because it, when I started doing this, there was one Balinese gamelan in the United States at UCLA. That was the first one. 
now there are hundreds. So they have the, these gamelan makers have an international market. Yeah. But in Bali itself, the number has been increasing as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. more and more. So do you have a gamelan also for the BBC? Yeah, this is the instruments from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Students can take a book credit. And we have a community ensemble too, which if anybody who wants to, who has time on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings can come. Online, of course. Yeah. At the Asian Center, there's one the Asian Center. And I heard that um, uh, the ensemble is playing at the Convocation right now? We did it already this week. Oh, okay. So like, they play at the University Convocation. Uh, yeah, so that was quite groundbreaking. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Um, you were saying that the music is constantly evolving, it's being influenced by modernity. How about the dancing? The dancing music? You want to answer? Uh, the dancing make the like collaboration or cohesion. It's like one is the natural from the beginning, but then makes another dancing and cohesion and more modern. And then about the clothes as well, more modern, and then uh, it's open for the public, not about for the sacral. There is a text for sacral, and then for the public as well. So they make a creation. But can you should give a, a little example of a movement or something that would be very traditional, and then how you would express it today? Can you demonstrate Agam? Oh, oh, oh. But well, we thought we might show you the basic dance posture, which is called Agam. Dancing for a woman, it's like here, and then for a man, it's like here. Uh, yeah. yeah, more stroke. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, how would you express it more modern? For the modern? Modern. Oh, modern, yeah. yeah. It's like. Yeah. Or like.
so I 